I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to see is a presentation with uh, Dell EMC and a panel of independent writers and speakers from around the world who focus on enterprise IT technology. If you'd like to see more about this, you can go to techfieldday.com. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it, go to youtube.com slash techfieldday. So we'll jump into the technical discussion. So this is kind of where the meat of the discussion is, and this is where I'll expect a lot of questions. And you know, I've got myself and John here as, the, as kind of the experts to kind of give you some more, uh, a con or more context as we go into some of this. But I want to talk about kind of all of the features and capabilities that I just kind of ran through really quickly around Isilon. Everything from how it's simple to manage, massively scalable, and of course these numbers are old. I should have updated them. 50 petabytes is no longer the maximum. Um, we now go to, you know, near on 70, and I guess with the Nitro we'll go to 90 petabytes in a single namespace, um, and 16 terabytes. I'm not sure that, that I guess that's the minimum because of SD Edge. 80% uh, storage utilization actually goes up with the Nitro environment, so you should expect to see kind of on the, um, you know, closer to 90% uh, in some of the, in the, the new environments. Uh, from a data protection perspective, the way that we protect data is we use erasure coding. So as we stripe data across nodes, you can set the amount of protection stripes that you want to have, which basically equates to the number of simultaneous failures that you can accept. So we can go up to plus four in the current generation. And so what that means is I can have four, either four drives fail or four nodes fail, but four different types of failures that can occur at the same time. And we can continue to serve that data. And what we'll do is in the background, we'll actually start rebuilding that data. So we'll get you back to a plus four. Imagine that a node fails. What we're going to do is we're not going to just leave it in a, oh, well, gosh, we have a, you know, stripes and, and data, uh, data that's out of service. We'll begin rebuilding across the remaining nodes so that you get back into a plus four and so that we can now accommodate another failure. In fact, we have an example of a customer who had a, a data center. And interestingly, there were water pipes over that customer's data center, and they formed a leak in the water pipes and water started dripping down onto the Isilon cluster. And so it took out a node, as in basically the water leaked into that node, basically the node went out, um, and the data rebuilt across the remaining nodes, and then it seeped down into the next node and killed it, and then the data rebuilt across the remaining nodes and seeped down to the next node and so on. And of course they got the alert and they fixed it in time, but at some point it would have been a problem because at some point you basically would have killed all the nodes, right? Um, you consumed all the remaining capacity. But it's a pretty interesting story about how resilient this thing is. Um, data protection will take you through, oh, so robust compliance and, and security options will take you through that. And that includes everything from what we call access zones, which is our multi-tenancy capabilities to role-based administration, which means that specific administrators can only do specific things. Uh, worm compliance that allows you to prevent people from deleting data for, for a certain number of, for a certain period of time, auditing, uh, encryption, uh, we have STIG hardening for the federal government to make sure that that cluster has been tested for uh, uh, vulnerabilities um, to operational flexibility. And then that goes into our whole data lake strategy, whether you're coming in through one protocol or another, you can really use this as a cluster that's kind of a, hey, this is a way to consolidate a lot of different workloads with a lot of different requirements, whether they be protocol or what have you. In terms of the architecture, Again, multi-protocol, single volume, single namespace. Now there's no, no concept here of disk management, of volume management, or aggregate management, or RAID group creation. None of that stuff happens in an Isilon world. Um, you'll see that in a lot of competitive products. You have to go and say, okay, well, I want to create you know, this disk grouping, and I want to create a file system on it, and a volume on it, and so on and so forth. There's just one file system. So we just automatically create that file system, and we expand across nodes. I, adding an Isilon node into a cluster is basically cable it up, you know, <coughs> uh, put it into the backplane, which is an InfiniMan backplane today. You know, we'll add other modalities in the future. Uh, turn it on, press a button on the front, and boop, it just basically adds capacity and performance and just joins the cluster, and that's it. It's a very quick operation. I can do it, so it must be not that bad. Um, in fact, I have done it. Uh, from the perspective of the actual external network, we provide connectivity over 1 gig E, 10 gig E. Actually, this is, uh, again, an out-of-date slide, so we actually provide 40 gig E now for uh, really high-end performance on the front end. Uh, and we can, we can actually drive greater than 10 gig E uh, on a single stream going out of the front end of that cluster. So um, we, can, we could saturate a 10 gig E today. 
And so that's why we need to put 40 gig E into the product. Uh, it's interesting that there are some competitors who have 40 gig E, but yet they can't really even fill a 10 gig pipe. So uh, we didn't put 40 gig E until we actually felt that we could actually do something greater than 10 gig. We try to be efficient about what we do. Uh, we provide some link aggregation, so you can actually get higher performance through link aggregation as well, and some redundancy as well. Um, on the back end, uh, today we use InfiniBand as a back end transport, and that provides all of the connectivity for the nodes to basically talk to each other either for data movement. So imagine when you talk to a node, you say, hey, I want to get extract a file out of that node. Remember that file does not reside only on that node. That file is striped across all, all, many of the nodes, not all the nodes, but many of the, well, in some cases all, but many of the nodes in the cluster. And so they basically have to collaborate with each other in order to bring back that file. That all happens over the backend InfiniBand network where they talk to each other, they lock the file, and then they retrieve the portions of that file in a sequential access to give you access to it. Or if you wanna, if you're connected into this particular client and you wanna touch a piece of the file just to do a quick uh, update, and that portion of the file resides on this node, they'll talk over the backplane. So the backplane is really what connects all of the nodes into a cluster. Questions? What, yeah, what data rates are you using on the InfiniBand? Uh, I believe we're at QDR today, which is 40 gig on the back end. That's where I was going next. So if you're going to have a 40 gig -y interface on the front end, when are you looking to upgrade the back end? Um, well, we're looking to upgrade the back end, but if you remember that uh, 40 gig -y on the front end um, we're doing 40 gig point to point on the back end. So the aggregate performance on the back end is huge. It's not like we just, just 40 gig. It's, it's potentially 40 gig for every node. So you do the math on that. It's, it's way more than what the front end can actually serve. Yeah. So, um, you know, at some point we'll look at doing higher uh, rates, but right now the 40 gig on the back end is sufficient to do 40 gig -y out of the front end. Right. But you're going to have, I mean, the way that, I forget the name of the technology, but the way you distribute the IPs across the front end interfaces. Yeah. I mean, in, in my world, in the HPC environment, you could have a lot of clients hitting it. Yep. So yeah. th that 40 gig on the back end is going to find a limit pretty quickly. Uh, you, if you were to go and saturate all of the front ends, then basically you'd saturate the entire back end. Um, and so, yes, we'll, we'll probably look at higher performance back ends uh, and obviously next generation platforms where we're so today we're not going to the full 40 gig E. We can go above 10 uh, and into you know just sub 20, if you will, on the front end. So the back end doesn't quite hit a maximum just yet. Okay. Um, but in the flash version, for example, where we're doing where we can saturate a 40 gig front end, then yes, then the back end obviously becomes pretty important. And so as you see us introduce the kind of the next generation uh, products, you'll see that you know, we've beefed up a lot of the networking capabilities in the product. If you can go to 100 plus nodes, yeah. potentially. So yep. how does that like uh, switching work in the back of that in terms of the InfiniBands? Are you, is the customer providing those or are you building that in and somehow bolting them on as you get bigger? Uh, we sell, we sell them. And uh, we resell basically uh, two different brands of, uh, of InfiniBand switches. Uh, those switches can be modular switches, which basically have uh, leaf nodes that go in. And so those will provide additional port capabilities and the ports go up to, uh, I believe it's uh, 288 for redundant 144, uh, which is our maximum uh, um, node count. So okay. 144 is kind of a limit today of the of the InfiniBand uh, switch. Obviously, as we go into larger node counts, if we do, then we'll have to look at other technologies on the back end for providing connectivity between nodes. So it's your switching that's actually the limiting factor here, not the technology kind of. itself. I mean, in a lot of ways, we've we've really tuned around that 144 numbers. The switches. I mean, there's no real way in InfiniBand to kind of daisy chain switches together. So it kind of works out. But uh, the truth is that we're going to go well beyond that in the future. So we're already way down the path of, hey, 144 is cute, but we're going to go into, you know, much larger numbers, right? Yeah. I mean, technically tie those two conversations together, right? You're, you're asking a flow question, which is if you do 40 gig on the front side and you're only feeding 40 gig on the back side from a data pump perspective, how do you scale this thing? And you're asking the question from a fabric perspective, what does that thing look like? 
we choose to build all the IB infrastructures today as mesh. Um, so it is unblocked, non-blocking uh, 40 gig from point to point on the back end fabric. That means that from a distribution standpoint, you've got 40 gig from a bandwidth standpoint. It's not actually 40 gig. Let's, we all know that QDR speeds are like 56 with 8, 10 bit coding and there's a protocol overhead and everything else. The thing to realize right now is, is that we are not bandwidth constrained or we cannot push a 40 gig pipe to 40 gig consumption on the current stuff. As we introduce new platforms, you'll see us change the back end network and continue to keep a pace with the back end network to make sure that it's not the bottleneck. But what you see is a pretty carefully balanced system where it doesn't make sense for us to, for instance, move to FDR or move to something else from a back end networking perspective because that is not the bandwidth constraint on the current system up until you get to some of the new things that David will talk about in terms of Nitro. Yeah, I guess, I mean, flow is definitely one concern, but if you have a failure issue and you're rebalancing at the same time, you've got a strong cluster mm -hmm. hammering the system. I mean, it's a failure scenario. As long as it's up, you're, you're happy, but yep. you, know, you yep. don't yep. necessarily want to constrain and, and, yourself. And, and to be frank with you, we do test that. We have a 144 node test bed that we test all of this stuff on, including injecting failures. So I think today in the 144 node test bed, we inject failures, what is every couple seconds for over the course of uh, a pretty large Oh yeah, I mean, like, time. like for instance, as part of uh, the, uh, the uh, system integration stuff, you know, to that failure question, Remember, we didn't talk about it here, but it's actually dual redundant backends, right? Um, uh, that are used from a from a redundancy standpoint. So, for instance, in part of the SI testing, uh, we take down alternate switches on the back end of a four of a 144. Uh, node system kind of at a regular pace, right? I think it's like every two minutes we drop a switch, have OpenSM, rebuild the infrastructure and drive it to the other side and then run that for days at a time. Um, so the whole infrastructure from a back end perspective is HA and then when you drop a node, you have to remember that um, if you're rebuilding around that node, that just comes into the overall I.O. budget of the system, right? So if a, if a node is capable of, let's say, <coughs> just depending on the node, 1.5 gigabytes a second in terms of sustained bandwidth, like for instance, uh, and you're doing a rebuild, you know, that rebuild ends up coming out of that, you know, kind of envelope number. In reality, very few people, as we work with our customers to architect that systems, you don't architect at envelope to workflow, you architect at envelope to workflow plus what is necessary in terms of taking care of kind of rebuild activities and stuff like that. And. Uh Technical curiosity. So you mentioned the IB network is a mesh. Mm -hmm. right? what, what's that sort of look like for um, the 144 node cluster? How many switches you've got? How are they? Going? One. It's a chassis switch. It's a 144 uh -huh. node chassis yep. switch. It's, okay. it, might, it might be a, a one of these modular ones where you've basically grown it to 144, but it's 144 by actually two, I believe, right? For mm -hmm. redundancy purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so there you go. So that's our back end. Uh, in terms of the actual cluster nodes, as I mentioned, you can put multiple of the nodes together into a single namespace. So from a file system perspective, it looks like just one large file system. It might consist of different node types and data might reside on the S series, on the X series, on the NL or HD series, and policies move that data up and down. Now from a file system tree or hierarchy perspective, it, again, nothing moves from the app to the applications. The application is not seeing data like go disappear out of a directory. It's just being moved in the back end um, and you might see the performance capabilities go up or down depending on where that particular data file resides. So the, the interesting thing again about this versus say some of the traditional kind of more uh, controller based architectures is that, you know, as I add capacity into a controller based architecture, let's say it's a dual controller, uh, classical HA pair type of a NAS system, uh, I guess the, the, the graphics kind of give it away. <laughs> but uh, um, what will happen is that you'll, as you start to add volumes and file systems into those controllers, you basically are adding more workload into that controller. And so all you're doing is basically as you, as you add capacity, you're just going to drive down the performance of that particular controller, right? Because it has to share the performance across all of those volumes. And in fact, in this kind of an architecture, you got to be really careful because if you put too much load on a controller, and then you have a failure event where a controller goes down or you're trying to do an upgrade where you take a controller down, the other controller has to provide the performance and resources for all of the volumes in that storage. Whereas in an isolon cluster, if I take this node down, the remaining nodes just keep 
operating. And so in a 20 node cluster, taking one down means you lose 5% of the performance, but you don't lose half the performance and all of the other nodes basically have to make up for the fact that you've lost half. Um, our performance scales linearly. So if you double the number of nodes, you get roughly double the performance, um, which is pretty, pretty nice because uh, each of the nodes has its own uh, motherboard and controller in there. Uh, so as I, again, as I add different node types, I'll get different performance curves, and those performance curves are optimized for either IOPS or throughput or capacity or what have you, and each of the nodes are basically tuned for that. Um, and you know, some of your data needs to be on the high performance nodes, but then those tend to be more expensive, so over time, if you need more cheap storage, you add different node types. 